I'll, I'll cough for something because that's always a good intro for us. Don't. It? That's exactly what you say in Baby Driver podcast. I'm not putting that twice into into do, do my I, podcast. Do I say that? <laughs> that's how you I'm start getting, it off. If you listen to it, I'm it getting lazy. With, I say like I say I don't know how to start this, and then you say I'll cough <laughs> exactly the same way. I, I didn't know. Oh, I'm getting I'm getting stale. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm running out of material already. <laughs> We're like right, I'm gonna be doing it a year. It's all, it's already like the second season of a sitcom that quickly loses steam. I'm like, already? I'll have to bring in my American cousin or something who looks just like me. But it's horse bits, just the female version of you. It's just you <laughs> in, like, in drag and they're never, in the, same, they're never yeah. like, in the same shot at the same time. <laughs> right. Hi and welcome back to uh, Real Opinions. Uh, today we're going to be covering, uh, well, it's, it's just really a war of the Planet of the Apes episode in its entirety. So we're going to be discussing it for non-spoilers for the first half, spoilers for the second half, and then, depending on whether or not I include it, we also have a, a long interview with uh, Karen Knovel, who plays uh, Maurice in the film, and so she kind of talks about how uh, she kind of got into the role, and just, it goes through the whole trilogy of her experience with the character, so it's yeah. it's really, yeah, concluding everything, but that'll be at the end of it, and... And it's a separate video as well. Yeah, it's also going to be a separate video up on the channel if you just want to if you just yeah. want to see that. Okay. So I suppose the best way to start off is that the way that I've kind of used Planet of the Apes is for the like the last year is it is it was the what it was the film where we most like had the different yeah. opinion. It's it's, it's it's our like metric for exactly. our disagreement. It's like um, it's like. Well, as you open the Baby Driver one, most we've disagreed since yeah, exactly. Planet of the Apes. <laughs> Which I find I find it really weird because I don't I don't know why. Like I could have I would have thought there would be films that we'd have a bigger I don't know That's void the, yeah. between us because like it's a well made blockbuster. It's not like it's a, an MCU film or anything like that. And I don't yeah. know I don't know why we disagree so much on it, but we just do. The thing is, well, I've I've since I've rewatched it again because I rewatched Dawn just before going into. War, war, like just like hours before going into war, and I enjoyed it a, a lot more than the the first time I watched it years ago. Mm-hmm. But I think the problems were still there. I think I just appreciated the good the ape scenes even more. Yeah. So I think the thing is, I don't know if that's down to just the fact that I've gotten more cynical, or it's just the blockbusters have just annoyed me more and more. I, over I, the last I few bet years. if I, in all seriousness, I bet if I, because I loved it at the time, and if you remember, it was my. Film yeah, of the yeah. year when we did that uh, best films of twenty fourteen list. It was my number one, mm. and I seriously bet if I did, I haven't watched it again in quite a while actually. Um, I bet if I watched it again now, I'd probably love it even more. Just because at the time I loved it for what it was, now mm. I'd probably love it for all the things it doesn't do that I'm sick yeah, of. That's, the, that's like, the main thing. Yeah, like it, it would be like, oh look, there's no constant quipping. Like every character isn't a comic relief. There's no blue laser in the sky. The the villain actually is has a purpose, and I'd, I'd actually enjoy it for the things it doesn't do as well as the things it does yeah, do. Yeah, well, that, that's exactly that's what I was finding the second time round. Is that I still, I think my overall points against it were still there. Like I mm. still find that not all the human characters, but because I think I think like Gary Oldman's character in it was yes. well set up. Like it, yes. he had enough. For the role that he was playing in it, I is- think the best part about Gary Oldman's character in that film is, and, and this is goes for the whole film for me, is that it didn't ever really feel to me like anyone was as simplistic as they would have been in another film. Like in in a worse version of Dawn for the Planet of the Apes, Gary Oldman would be like, "You've got two days to convince them, otherwise we're going to go in and kill them all because that's what I want to do, and I'm a n- lunatic." Whereas he is like rational and like I, I don't want to fight, but we'll if we have to, we have to because we need to survive. Yeah, and he's a he isn't a bad guy, and he's not even like in a even in a traditional blockbuster, he might be a sympathetic bad guy. He might be a bad guy that you understand, but mm. I think as far as Dawn the Planet Apes is concerned, he's not a bad guy at all. He is literally just doing what he needs to do for his people, and that is just uh, at odds with what other with what the ape characters yeah. are doing. I think I got it right off the bat with the second time watching it. I still think that overall it's 
a very by the numbers blockbuster. I know you don't agree with that, mm. but for me, it was just the fact that I think the presentation just elevates it for me because it's like it starts off with the uh, with the newsreel kind of setup of this mm. is what's happened since the last film, and the first time watching that, I just kind of rolled my eyes because it is a really like it's a it's almost like a video game film thing that they do like mm. where they set they have to like give the exposition right at the beginning and they just dump it all on you, but seeing it again. I liked that it basically just had three functions, really, in that they had this really cliche thing, but they did something new with it, where it was showing the connections going around the world, visually mm. showing that humans were dying out, as well as, you know, filling in on everything. It was the fact that it was trying to combine multiple things, and it was doing a new spin on something that I had seen before. Well, well I... Because you say it's like dumping exposition, but it's not... It's not... Re- it is just humans gone, mostly now, which is something that... You could probably cut out and you'd still get that. It's not like it's providing with lots of plot points. It is just generally showing you how how things have escalated since the end of Rise. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, when I say dump, I don't mean like it's not too much. It's not like I'm going slow down. It's not it's not the mummy. Like you said, <laughs> it's you could, not yeah, like voice exactly. it. But it's just, I'm just saying is that, like you said, you could cut it out and it wouldn't affect anything. What I like about it is that I think, even though it's it's just really like a shot of a map... I think it's quite emotional. I think it's a successfully emotional exposition map. And that's mostly because of Michael Giacchino. Who... Yeah, that's the thing, is that the score is the most powerful thing for that mm. moment. But anyway, um, you just I think we're getting a little hung up on specificities with Dawn. Well, yeah. that's what I was just... Point, the main point from that was that it was kind of... That was like a, a small aspect of a greater whole in that mm. I think it is just down to... Matt Reeves' presentation that elevates a lot of what there is in the film. It's not just Matt Reeves. It is, like, I think everyone from performances... Oh, I'm not saying that there's not brilliant acting and all mm. of that, but it's. I think that he's the vital component to making yeah. it... Well, there is... There is I, I, I mean, I, I know some people don't agree with this, but I, I don't care they're wrong. Uh, there is a humongous jumping quality between Rise of the Planet of the Apes and Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. It's... It's... Mm. It's... it's, it's I, I would go as far as to say it's like a Star Trek the motion picture to Star Trek the Wrath of Khan level just massive fucking jump between the first film and the second film. And so I do think the thing that changed was Matt Reeves came along and also brought across some of his people to work on it. And I think so. I think that that makes sense. I do think that Matt Reeves is, as you say, the mm. vital component. Like I, I, again, I won't go into the specificities, like you said, of all the problems that I had with that. But it, it, it was just, I think I appreciated the human characters more, just not for the characters themselves, but for their purpose in the plot. And especially mm-hmm. after seeing War, now mm-hmm. I think uh, the main point that you're going to have for War, I think definitely, I appreciated a lot more when thinking back on Dawn after seeing War. Okay, but we're going into. Did you just want to go into? What your overall thoughts were for war? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so just to just to slightly recap, um, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, my favorite film of twenty fourteen. Mm. Uh, one of I think possibly still my favorite blockbuster that I've seen since then. Probably uh, unless I'm missing something massive that I, that, and I'm talking proper blockbuster. I don't mean like something like Kingsman or whatever. That's not. I mean like uh. A big studio, a yeah, hundred million dollar blockbuster. This film I liked very, very, very much. I did not like it as much as Dawn. Mm. I still, I think it's the second best of the trilogy. I think that it does a lot of the things that I did love about Dawn of Planet of the Apes are maintained. Like I think the score is still brilliant. I think the performances are still really strong. I really like its tone, its sort of sense of patience, and its relative depth for the type of film it is. And I think that there are moments in it that I really, really... Where I did love it as much as Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Like, individual moments. And I think, for me, the the overall reason I would say that I didn't like it as much was just because I preferred the story in Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Yeah. The main reason I preferred the story, and I think the more I've thought about it, the main, this is why Dawn is better than War, is because of Koba. I think that Koba is the best villain that has been in any of these type of films in a long time, and he brings out the more interesting aspects in the other characters, in how they react to him, in how they are sort of defined in relation to him. 
And without Koba in this, I felt like the film lost a bit of its depth because it became more about apes versus humans and less this sort of complicated thing where there are good guys and bad guys on both sides and everyone has intricate motivations. It felt like because it became more apes, good guys, humans, bad guys, it felt a little bit more simple. And I think that obviously we know the apes are the best characters in this. Everyone says that. And so having an ape as a villain was great. We now have a human villain. He's a little less compelling. And uh, Yeah, I just think Koba felt like the special thing that this was missing. But I think everything else about it stayed at the same level. The technical execution, the cinematography, all that stuff was just as good. But I felt like because it became apes versus humans, I just didn't think it was quite as compelling as the more... I would say the less by the numbers approach that Dawn of the Planet of the Apes had. I felt like this was more like a by, by the numbers blockbuster, but a very, very well made mm. one. I, I definitely agree with the fact that it feels like something with the antagonist is just missing. It's definitely the, the threat. Mm. Like there's more of a threat than I'd say there is in the second one, but it doesn't feel as compelling, even though it's not as. No, I don't think it was as, as compelling. Like scale wise, it's not as big of a threat, I believe. And mm. you're right, it's just that, it, like, Cobra is much more compelling. The way that I sort of found it when re-watching Dawn is that it's, I think, through the simplicity of having them doing the sign language and just the very simple language mm. is that it breaks down the story into just the most simplest of emotions, really. And I think, yeah. like, watching it again, it almost reminded me of seeing, this sounds like it's heaping too big a praise on it, but it, like the same basic level that you get with Shakespeare almost now. No, I agree. No, I do. I, I don't think that that's heaping too much. It's because you're not saying it is as good as yes. Shakespeare, but it yeah. is definitely. I think Dawn of the Planet of the Apes is definitely reminiscent of Shakespeare, and I don't think that Wolf the Planet of the Apes is. And I think that that was a, a, a loss of some of the emotional power and the depth. Well, that's the thing, is that well when I like do the Shakespeare comparison, like it's about very basic emotions but very like strong emotions so it's about treachery yeah. and about you know what it takes yes. to be a leader which is a big thing in all of the Shakespeare stuff. Mm. Koba is definitely like a, an iago -y. Exactly. That's yeah. why he's, a, he's an iago -y Shakespearean villain and the colonel in this is... He's just uh, evil. Uh, really. Obviously he's, he's... I mean he has a purpose. He, he, the way I would define him is that he is like by another blockbuster standards he'd be quite deep because he has mm. the moment where he explains yeah. himself and he has a motivation. By another blockbuster standards, he would be a deep character because he is a villain who is understandable. But if we go back to the Gary Oldman thing, I would say that Gary Oldman was just a character who ended up being in this conflict because of what he needed. Yeah. He wasn't really villainous. He yeah. didn't act or behave like a villain. Whereas Woody Harrelson in this is a villain who is understandable. Uh, yeah. So it's yeah. still it's still not like he's just a cartoonish villain, but it is like a step closer towards that. And again, well, like you said, with, with Cobra, he doesn't have much in the first film, but there is the setup in the first film, as well as, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, the, yeah. he does have a reasoning that's quite like valid for his complete hatred of humans and leading him to pushing... Oh, up. yeah. And yeah. There are parts in Dawn of the Planet of the Apes where I feel like he's almost right. Mm. Maybe like I'm taking it a little too far, but there are parts where you kind of go, yeah, Caesar, Caesar should be looking after his people more. He is, he is putting everyone in danger, and he, he should be... And you, you kind of, like, get it. Whereas with, with Woody Harrelson, it's like, I get it. I get why you've gone mad. Yeah. You're not acting rationally. I understand why you're not acting rationally. Whereas with Cobra, it's like, no, I fully understand why you're doing the things you're doing. Just to, to get away from just the villain talk, the main thing is that also the story is not as compelling. Yeah. Because it is... When you say war for the planet of the apes, it makes it sound like, again, it's going to be a one-on-one -on -one conflict, but it's really not mm. for the majority of the film. For the majority of the film, it's just quite slow them sort of slowly getting towards breaking out. I do think it's a weird title choice, because yes. I would say Dawn of the Planet of the Apes is more war yes, than this. Yes, definitely. definitely. feels much more like a war film. And in a way, this is more like the Dawn of the Planet of the Apes in the, in the way that it ends. It, mm. it, it kind of could almost I be switched could around. Yeah. No, I think definitely think it could. And 
the thing was from the from the beginning of this, it does set up like it's going to be war because I think that the beginning scene of yeah. this was actually my favorite. I agree. Yeah, well, it's it's just the fact that I agree. Had the patience as well as the action, and I think the patience made the action actually more compelling, like going slowly. Yes. It was one of those things where I watched it, and I, I was enjoying the film, but I was more thinking I'd really like Matt Reeves to direct battle scenes in another film, like, just, just direct battle mm. scenes, like, if he was doing, like, a Game of Thrones episode, I would enjoy yeah, that, yeah, like, yeah, I yeah. would want him to see him direct good. a Game of Thrones episode, yeah. because he, when he does the action, he knows that, like, yeah, when they're storming that base... That it does get a bit mm. cliche with some of the slow mo shots of like people like apes exploding and stuff. Which but... again, I uh, to my recollection, there weren't as many of those in Dawn. I'm not sure if I, I don't remember any of that. No, no, I think I think so too. And so it was definitely going for a bit more of a sadder tone, which I think let let mm. the action slip a bit. But I think that. that that beginning scene was more war than anything else we got in the rest of it, and I was ho- and I was hoping yeah, that it was a setup yeah. for more to come. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I I do agree, and, and we, I think you touched on something there. Where you you just said that you think this film is sadder, and I think that's right, and that's another reason I think I prefer Dawn. Like Dawn has like it's 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 got tragedy in it, and it's got emotional stuff, but it also has moments of warmth. Yeah. It feels a bit more melancholic. It's like there is goodness in it. There's that moment when they um when they get the power working and they hear the song playing in the gas station and it's like a, a moment of genuine sort of touchingness. Yeah. And then it cuts to Cobra on his way to screw everything up and you know he kills like uh, the the asshole guy. And it, and it's in that was always one of my favorite parts because it felt like it was balancing the tone quite well and like it was going from a happy moment to a dark moment, and then they both felt better because of it. Whereas this is a lot more consistently sad, and I felt like it could have used some more of the touching stuff that Dawn of the Pirate of the Apes had, because I think that the highs and lows help to actually accent- like accentuate each yeah, other. No, definitely. And make each other feel better, whereas this had a much more consistently dark tone that in a way made it feel less... Dark, almost. And I think that that tone, I think, definitely... Because I'd say that this actually goes... War goes at a, a similar pace to Dawn, but it feels slower. Yes. Because it doesn't have those rises and falls. Mm. It, I mean, it doesn't... It's still a 12, mm. but I mean, isn't it? Uh, it is still a 12, but there were parts where I was like... That's... I bet that's on the edge. I yeah. bet, I bet like, that could have could have gone over. Like, uh, there's crucifixion and stuff. I mean, it's not... On screen, but it was still pretty like like dark. Yeah. It wasn't just like a crucified body. It was like he woke up and was panicking and terrified, and it was it was upsetting. Um, and that I was surprised by how much they got away with. Yeah, yeah, definitely. whipping scenes. Yeah, yeah. Got, well, and, and <laughs> well, like you said, from from the beginning, it kind of like they kept changing what type of film they want to, wanted to make because at the beginning, there's lots of Vietnam references when it's in the war. Lots of Vietnam references, mm. like they call the monkeys Kongs, like the Viet Cong, <laughs> mm. because for the, well, it's I know, the, that's donkey, the thing, Kong. It's donkey Kong, but obviously that's the, what they're going for is like yeah. the Viet Cong, and like they've got like ape killer, the like that's the now. first shot, isn't it? Ape killer written on the back of the helmets mm. and stuff like yeah. that. That's all very Vietnam, and then and obviously he's Kurtz. Oh yeah, 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 and then I've read Heart <laughs> Just look, just gotta put that in there. <laughs> do you just have a Goodreads account and the only thing it says is Heart of Darkness just like 50 times <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then about halfway through it suddenly changes that and goes no we're making a holocaust film I don't think it I don't think it, it suddenly changed well, it I think drops, it's making it a war film every and Vietnam drawing... reference and then it suddenly picks up no, no it doesn't no. well it doesn't do any new ones is what I'm saying. I don't think it's particularly going for. We are referencing this particular war. I think they're just taking bits and pieces from war in general. I don't think that World War Two owns 
prisoner of war count. Well, it was the fact that I don't think it's it got was, a patent was... on them. And I don't think that having helmet writing means that you are automatically restricted to just doing Vietnam. Well, the thing is, is that it, that's what it's iconic from. It's from the Vietnam War. Like, Full Metal Jacket, yeah. that's the poster cover for it. And it's in every single Vietnamese mm. film. There's always someone with a catchy slogan written on the helmet. Yeah. But the thing was, for this one, is that there were so many comparisons with it so it had it was the snowy pow camp with the railway tracks going right through the middle which are yeah iconic feels bad to say but it is it's 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 what you <laughs> no, I, I get it. It. and yeah. it had the uh, the viewing platform that woody harrelson stands from which is to me it's reminiscent of things like schindler's list and he does yeah. the yeah oh, def- oh, he does the, yeah. the cross sign as well almost like it's a uh, i mean i know that's sort of joking but at the same time it, it mm. For me, it was a lot of parallels for that, and I thought at some point I was just going, "Okay, I, okay, I get it." <laughs> I don't. I think it's just taking war conventions in general, because I mean, it even has like going back to a biblical war. It has like Moses references and things mm. like that too. I think it's just war in general, and it's just drawing on different parts of history where it needs to. I don't think it's. I don't think it needs to be stuck to, to, to one war theme. I don't think they needed to rigidly just do Vietnam references or just do Holocaust references. Um, we have we have talked quite a bit in... When, when I'm being critical, I'm not... Like, I realise that I sound really critical, but it's more me just explaining why I like Dawn mm. more than necessarily trying to crap on this. No, I get what you mean. Um, yeah. Because... Like that's that's all I'm doing because when I when when I came back I said to to Ben like I, I did like Dawn more and he went why and I just I just wanted to explain why I liked Dawn the Planet of more but I do really 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 like this a lot and there are to go on to some of the good stuff I think that you're absolutely right about Matt Reeves being such a pivotal piece of this from that opening action sequence to that I really like the bit in the caves as well yeah. Yeah. Um, there's that moment, you know, with the um, he's really good with just little but not showy visuals. You know, like other directors would do big in your face things if they were going for look. I'm I'm putting my stamp yeah, yeah. on this. Whereas he has a good way of having like a directorial style that is very unshowy and very just like I'm just going to make the film. I well. would say that he has. Well, I mean, you stand by the argument of people not getting like what an auteur means in like the modern. Mm-hmm. And I would say that Matt Reeves, from what I've seen, definitely is just from these two series. Yes, because yes. I would say that he. I think he's really good with putting visuals into a sequence. Like when mm-hmm. I was watching it, Dawn again, and the beginning of War, mm-hmm. especially for this, the sequences flow really very well with the visuals, and mm-hmm. I think the visuals are much more striking than many many blockbusters. And no, I don't think just many many blockbusters, but many many films. That's the thing is that they feel really really cinematic. That's yeah. the thing in it, yeah. and I think that, like you said, it's because the auteur is someone with a re- easily recognizable style, like that's done it through the system, working within the constraints of the system. Yeah. I'd say that Matt Reeves is actually a brilliant example of that in the in the modern yeah. era. Yeah. Just to give some non-spoilery examples of moments where that's evident. Like the, just like the bit where um when you know, stood by the waterfall and the green laser yeah. sight kind of goes through the water and it's like, "Oh, that is so cool, but not showy offy." And things like that are just really good and he's very very good as well. We we touched upon this in the interview that we did. Dialogue free storytelling yeah. in a way that never feels boring. And that is something that I get bored with very easily. Like, you know, Nicholas Winding Refn films, people mm. love Drive or whatever for the oh, he can tell a story without dialogue, but it's like yeah, but he tells it boringly. <laughs> like it's like it's like okay, he he can. It doesn't mean he should. But um and and it's something that frustrates me quite a lot like I feel like okay but dialogue shouldn't be a dirty word like if, if you can use dialogue and it's good fucking yeah. use it but Matt Reeves is a good example where I think he does do dialogue free storytelling in a way that is completely engaging never boring and often quite touching like well the thing is as well I, I, I'm saying more about Dawn <laughs> than I had with Ward to be honest yes but I think that's yes. just that's showing that again, like you said, I think Dawn was the better film to war. But mm-hmm. I think that the thing was with Dawn is that the non-dialogue scenes were so much more compelling than the dialogue scenes. I don't know if it's just mm-hmm. because they were more basic so you could easily get to the, the heart of the scene more, maybe. I think it's because they're focused on the more interesting as well characters because yeah. the non-dialogue but, scenes are the ape scenes. 
the thing about every human scene, not just because of the characters, but I felt like he handled, he just handled like kinetic directing. I suppose I'm not trying to sound mm-hmm. too fancy with it, but I'm trying to find the right word for it more than conversation, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 no, it does. But yeah, I think he is absolutely an asset to this. And obviously Andy Serkis is oh, as well. I don't really yeah. know what more there is to say about Andy Serkis besides he is the best at doing this. And there, there is a reason that they come to him for these roles all the time. And it's because he's very, very goddamn good. But so are the others as well. Um, obviously, we have our interview with... Um, with Karen Knovel, yep. and um, she's Maurice has always been one of the fan favorite characters, and same again. Yeah, and all the other apes. Uh, st- I liked Bad Ape. I-, I wondered what you were gonna say on Bad Ape. Couldn't tell if he'd annoy you or if you'd like him. But I, I think that all of the um, ape performances were really strong. Again, I think all the ape performances were strong. Definitely, it's not just because. They're apes, there's just something, they are just more captivating, I think. There's just yeah. focus on the way that they're acting, rather than just just standing still. There's something, there's always something happening with mm. them. Or, But I, did, I didn't find Bad Ape annoying at any point. I didn't find him funny all the time, when I felt like I should be finding him funny. There were parts where I found him funny. Um, I, it, was, it, was, it was mostly because it reminded me of... of, of how we talk when we're being <laughs> idiots the, yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Like when he goes, oh no, and things like that. <laughs> he, was, he was close to being a Jar Jar character. I think he could have been, but wasn't close. I think he, he, he like, the potential for Jar Jar was there. Because when you when you say, oh no, it makes me think of like... No, well that's Jar-Jar true. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't think he was close. But I think he could yeah, have been. Yeah. If it wasn't for Matt Reeves, for Steve Zahn... For all of the elements that made him not annoying. Um, apart from, obviously, that he is a, an overt reference to the Black Lives Matter movement, which I did <laughs> find in poor taste. Obviously, because that guy owns blue jackets. Think, if you don't know that news story, I think you'll have to look it up to get more relevance to what we're talking about. But yes. That, that was ridiculous. But it's fucking ridiculous. But, um, the thing with, with Bad Ape was that I think in Dawn I would have found him annoying. But because it was war and because okay. it was so sad all the time, I was thankful. For yeah, the no, he was needed he here. Was... Like I didn't need a comic relief in Dawn because the tone wasn't so unrelenting. Yeah. So like there wasn't a need for comedy because there were moments of just niceness. Yes, definitely. Which means it didn't need comedy because there were hopeful moments. Whereas here, it's so dark, the comedy was needed and the poop throwing. Boop throwing. Yeah, I did find the boop throwing funny. Yeah, I'll give I'll give it that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think I don't think Bad Ape got better past his introduction scene when they're talking. In the no, scheme. I thought, but that's that's like his only scene. That's true. Yeah. After that, he's just kind of there. Yeah, yeah. But it was a good scene. It was one of my favorite scenes actually. So yeah, I think all the ape characters are just as strong as they have always been. And whilst we said that the story wasn't as compelling as Dawn, there are still lots of things they did that I thought were really good. And again, brave, and wouldn't have been done in a in an MCU film. There are so many things in here that I thought, like, no way would this happen in most blockbusters. No, like the idea of Cobra, of of sorry, of Caesar becoming Cobra and things like that were good plot points, and it it made it feel like. Not just attacked on sequel, but like, and it does feel like a third part of the story, in a in a conclusive way, and I like how things like the Cobra stuff do carry on into this. Mm. And I did find Caesar's uh, internal conflict and all that stuff was was good story, even if it wasn't as good as the conflict, the ideological conflict in Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. I think they could have pushed Co- uh, Caesar's inner conflict a bit more, actually. Like, because I never felt like he got fully... I never felt like he was... There was a point where he could be lost, if that makes sense. I, what, about when he, what about when he finds the traitor? The traitor... That's the thing, is that I don't... Gorilla. I think that they could have... Again, I still think they could have pushed that more. I liked that they reincorporated Koba back into it. I like how they did it. Mm-hmm. And I think that it def- definitely made Caesar's character a lot more interesting than if it was just 
Caesar's trying to get revenge. I think it's it makes mm-hmm. it much more interesting if there's also yeah this inner conflict, and I think it's just another thing that proves that the apes' characters are way more compelling. Mm-hmm. But I would mm-hmm. I just wanted a bit. I I wanted Caesar to go a bit darker for me to not break bad. <laughs> I'm trying to think, like just where <laughs> where at some point you are questioning whether or not he is becoming too far. Because I never felt like I was ever going. I I never felt like he was. He wouldn't end up doing the right thing. It wasn't. I don't. I don't think the question was ever. Is he going to become a villain? It oh, was more no. that he wasn't acting res- responsibly for his people. Like he was putting everyone in danger quite stubbornly. Like there's that part in the, the I don't know what you want to call it the work camp where he stands up to them and gets the other one right. shot. And it's like you know, it's not that he's he's teetering onto the edge of, of evil, it's that he is so stubborn and so so confrontational that he is doing more bad than good at right. certain points. Okay, I could I could see that side of the argument for it. Like there's the part where he um mild spoilers, mild, where he tries to attack um the colonel, tries to kill him, and he says, What do you think would have happened if you killed me? What what would have happened to your apes? And and it's like that's the that's the point more that he's not that he's that he's on the edge of being lost, but that he's not even thinking properly anymore, that he's so consumed by just this one idea that he's not thinking about the repercussions that it would have on the people that he's supposedly leading and supposedly trying to protect. Okay. I think that's just the difference between... you. Yeah, I think that they could have done a tiny bit more with it. But, yeah, or just, no, that's fine. Yeah. That's very subtle things as well as... And, and always the apes are very understanding with Caesar. I'm not saying, like, have a... Almost like, you know, with every like rom com there's the third act breakup before everything comes all nice again. Not yeah. not like a full breakdown mm. of communication or something, but they always just seemed very like we're behind you the whole way. Yeah. Which again, again to do our thing of going back to Dawn isn't the case in mm. Dawn. Yes, definitely yeah. Where a good chunk of them go like, No, sc- screw you, you're you're leading us badly. And and even like Rocket's one of the ones that sort of half follows Cobra yeah. and Rocket's one of his friends. And that that is again another thing. It's 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 all coming back to that whole idea that Dawn felt a bit more complex, not just within characters having more complicated emotions, but every the humans and the apes had such sort of complicated rivalries and differing motivations. Like there was Koba wanting all out war, Caesar wanting to just protect his people, people other apes in between that were kind of halfway between the both didn't want completely Cobra but didn't want completely Caesar and then the humans where like Gary Oldman wants to protect his people but he's willing to do some not so nice things to do it and it felt a lot more complex whereas here it does as you said it's like apes good all apes behind Caesar humans bad all humans behind him except for little girl it did feel very simplified in its in its values and its sides. Mm-hmm. And I think that as well, when you take into the fact that it was less of a dynamic plot and more of a one, one location trying to achieve one thing for the entire mm. runtime, I think it did feel slower and it did feel like less happened than in Dawn. Yeah, I think Dawn feels like the most important film in the trilogy. Yeah. Like the most yeah. impactful, the most uh, story driven and the most the one that has the most consequences Overall, mm. I, I do think that's fair. Okay, I, I wanted the apes to factor. I know it sounds weird to say, but I want wanted the apes to have more of a an active role in everything, because I know that mm-hmm. it sounds strange, but really it's just it feels like it's just a human thing, and apes are just there, and the apes like it. It doesn't feel like the apes are well. They're the main characters of the film, but it doesn't feel like they're the main players in the grand scheme of things. I kind of, I think I know what you're wanting to say, and we'll cover it in the spoiler section because I think I get what you're getting at. But obviously, I think well, just, just like you said, is is, I, I think just like you said, is that the last film felt like it was war, and this film feels like it was dawn. Yeah, I think that's just just the yeah. main thing to come from it. But again, really want to stress, I liked the film a lot, and most of that is to do with the craftsmanship more so than the story this time. Mm. But that craftsmanship is damn good. Michael Giacchino is damn good. Uh, the cinematography is damn good. The special effects are the best. That's the one that they are just unbelievable. 
They have they have noticeably improved from dawn actually. Yeah, they are just on fucking believable at, p- at mm. points. Um, not just in terms of like photo real animations, but in like little details, like the way snow is on fur yeah. and things like yeah. you know you know like kind of environmental things like that. It's unbelievable at times. And the the bit the highest compliment that I would pay to the special effects is actually that in like a lot of films you'll sit there going like wow that's a good special effect. Yeah. Whereas, yeah. eventually in this, you're just like, yeah, that's, they're just apes. To have, mm. and, and you kind of just completely stop noticing. And that is goddamn impressive. The thing that has stood out for me from this film is just the technical aspects more than anything. I mean, and that, that's included mm-hmm. in, like you said, the directing and the score and everything, is that it does, they are very, very well-made blockbusters, definitely. Well, yes. the special effects are amazing, I think, just in the way that they managed to realise the characters makes them even mm-hmm. more effective. Oh, yeah. I mean, it'd be one thing to have them be amazing, but to be amazing effects, but to, to have them act convincingly yeah. and behave yeah, convincingly the yeah. is the other element that really pulls it off. And that is both the actors and Matt Reeves. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, are there any other non spoilery points? Not really for me. I think, I think uh, because a lot of our, I think, both criticisms and positives are story point yeah that's the thing. i think that that's that's where we need to go next but i would just say oh fucking see it it's very good it's very very good um if if you're wanting an all-out war film then maybe don't <laughs> just your expectations or just don't go um because it is i would say it's not even an action film at this point it is like yeah. a a blockbuster drama Definitely. kind of it's it's very not well not talky but very very character based and very very slow uh which i think is a good thing but but if you are wanting a big big blockbuster action film and that is not what this is but i think it is a damn good film and i think that it should be seen if you if you have the patience for it i think if you thought dawn was slow at any point i don't think mm-hmm. you would like this well that's i agree with you but this is the funny thing right is i agree with what you just said but I know that Ben thought Dawn was slow and liked this one more. And I know that other people have too. There have been some, mm. like Empire said this was the best one and, and other people saying it too. So like, I feel like we're, we're on the same page yeah. here, but it feels like no one else agrees with us. So I'm, I'm a little like, I don't, I'm not sure. Besides the special effects, like, because that's just mm. a technical, purely technical improvement. I can't think of anything yeah. that this film has over Dawn. No, no, I can't either. Except for, except for maybe saying darker. Yeah, and I don't mean that as a critic because oh, I yeah. think Dawn is pretty near perfect for me. But like, yeah, I don't, I don't understand. I mean, there have been people. Some people have said Dawn is better. I have seen some people say Dawn is better. Um, I have yet to see a single person say that Rise of the Planet of the Apes is the best one because that person would be mental. <laughs> but um, I've seen people say that War is the worst of the trilogy. Have you? Yeah, I haven't seen anyone say that. I haven't seen. I've I've always seen either Rise or Dawn is the best. Um, I've never seen War is the worst. I I feel like the consensus is consistently that Rise is yeah. the worst. But yeah, but yeah, I am surprised by how so many people have considered this one better than Dawn because I do just think it is deeper and Dawn is deeper and more compelling. What are you gonna do though? Good, good for them. Yeah, good good for them. It's like that some people think the Dark Knight Rises is better than the Dark Knight, and I'm like, no, what? Yeah, there are there are some people. Red Letter Media think it, and I'm like, what are you on? What? What? No, it's not. That's bizarre. It is bizarre, but there are some people who think Spectre's the best of the Daniel Craig. It's so strange. I I don't get it either. So what are you gonna do? It's still good. The thing is, that's, that's, that's the important that's thing. Some people, like I feel like I feel like <laughs> more, a majority of people think it's better than Dawn. That's true. Yeah, it does. It feels like a bigger group than yeah, with, say, yeah. the Dark Knight Rises. Anyway, well, we don't think that. No, <laughs> you don't. No. the best of the trilogy, and I'd agree with you on that one. Yes. Would you? Would you agree that Rise is the worst of the trilogy, or do you think War? Uh, for me, I think War. But if I was to recommend it to War. right most people, I'd say watch Rise over War. Wait, so which one do you prefer? I prefer you War, prefer War I think over Rise for right, general okay. audiences. I think Rise. My, it's it's more I think it's faster paced and I think it's got the more heartwarming story because it's James Franco and the uh, baby Caesar. But you have 
No, I guess it's not quite as... I was going to say you have uh, Nova and Maurice in here, but I guess it's not as central. No, it's not as central, and I don't think it's as rewarding. But here's the thing. This film doesn't have James Franco in it, and that is a massive plus for me, because <laughs> I find him to be such an off-putting man, <laughs> such a creepy, weird man. <laughs> the thing is, is that I don't really have any real hatreds for any... Oh, like, I don't hate no, and no, I don't have any like grudges against actors mm. or actresses, particular ones, unless mm. unless they are just generally bad at their job. Like, but mm. I don't. I, it seems like every like you, James, Ben, like Chris, you all seem to have like particular actors that the moment they show up, you're just like, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't be bothered <laughs> with this. I, it's not that I, I don't think he's a bad actor, but I feel like he has a very specific thing and should stay away from mainstream films because I always find him weird. Right. But he's not a he's not a convincing human being. <laughs> I, I think it's it's like I can't ever believe him as just a normal man because right. like like in. Like, it's just things like his smiles and things are just really strange and alien. There's, there's... I, don't, I don't believe him as, as a person. Like, if he wants to do weirder roles, that's fine. But when he's like Harry Osborn or just a scientist, I don't like, no, you, you, you're being weird and creepy still. He'll be perfect as Tommy Wiseau. Like, that is, that is like exactly who he should. We're getting sidetracked quite a bit. So back to back to War of the Planet. Spoilers now. So now you can say what you were going to say about my. I made a point about the film not having to stick to one war homage, and you said there's something I want to say about that. But well, I'll the get thing to it is, later. is that I feel like I might just be speculating too much with this, but I felt like the whole point of the film was humans were going to kill each other anyway. Like humans were doomed mm-hmm. anyway. Again, this is very like I'm not saying this is definitely what they're trying to go for. But I felt like it. So it started with the Vietnam kind of references, and then it went back mm. to the Second World War references for it. Yeah, yeah. It's like channeling how this is in our history. Yeah, it's basically like people. It's cases. basically just people like reversing progress for mankind, and then they go back yeah. to caveman stupidity, yeah. and then they all die in the yeah. avalanche, which is basically. I don't know if you wanted to word it like a the natural equalizer. Yeah. It's like the world's had enough of our shit, so we're exactly. gone. Exactly, and I think that was the thing that irked me at the end was the fact that the whole point of it basically was apes have nothing really to do with it. Humans were just doomed from the start. Humans caused their own demise. No. Well, this is my other problem. This is so my my number one problem is it didn't feel as deep as apes for the for, as dawn for the reasons we went into. My number two problem was that I felt even for the drama and even though we know it's slower, and even though we know all these things and it's not a big Michael Bay action film, I still felt like that ending, inverted commas, war, was quite unsatisfying, both in terms of its brevity, in terms of the fact that half of it's off screen, and then, as you said, the fact that it is resolved by just a natural occurrence, not by any characters particularly doing something. Mm. And I think that's an intentional decision. I think that they were very much going for something about how it was in the end, it was out of anyone's control and it is yeah. the planet, the, the, it's fate or whatever. I, it was definitely an intentional choice. It was just one that I didn't like. And I, I would have much rather if characters, if, if Caesar or if the apes did have some kind of role besides like they get kidnapped and then they get out and this all just sort of happens with them on the side. Well, the thing is, I think it's just, I think it's just a way more compelling ending if you have it as humans realizing that their time is gone, more mm. than they all die in an avalanche after killing one another. Mm. Like it feels very much like it's mu- it's much. I think it's much more compelling when. When the characters realise what's going to happen, as opposed to just it happens to them, and now they're no longer in it whatsoever. Yeah, like I did like um, on that subject. I did like how they resolved the Woody Harrelson thing. I did like that rather than going in for revenge or anything, it was this moment of weird empathy yeah. of of like them going in and both understanding. Like I get what you want to do. I get like like they both kind of finally understood each other in a, in another great dialogue free moment it, yeah. and it was unex- I would say relatively unexpected obviously you get the thing where you see her talk doll thing yeah 
and you know that that's going to come into it. But I didn't expect that that would literally be the downfall yeah, yeah, yeah. of the main villain. Like, I thought maybe it would cause a complication, allowing the apes to break out or something. Didn't think it was going to be something so small, so seemingly insignificant, that would just wipe out the main villain. And it was it was an unexpected thing in a good yeah, way. Yeah, and I liked, I liked how they got rid... Uh, I liked Woody Harrelson's ending. Mm-hmm. Like, the villain yeah. becoming the thing that they hate. That's another more mm. compelling ending than just them fighting to the death usual style. Yes. But um yes. while I found Woody Harrelson's ending compelling, the rest of the fighting after that was just not I mean sure you were rooting for Caesar to survive, but I wasn't rooting for much mm-hmm. else besides that. It was just no. I want Caesar to survive and that's it. Which is why it would have helped to have more balanced human characters like in Dawn. Yeah. To have some of the humans not be like the the closest you have is that one guy with the crossbow mm. who did who was kind it was like hinting at yeah, him having that, that kind weird. of interesting conflict but didn't really go anywhere. I felt like, but like it felt like it was going yeah, that definitely. way, <laughs> and then and then that was just it. Yeah, I feel almost and again. I, I've always said how I hate in reviews people just pitch their own ways how they would have done the film, but I feel like it would yeah. have worked better just the theme alone if it was almost like the size has been switched from Dawn to humans being the underdogs and apes being the... and yeah. then ending in defeat, basically. Well, that's... That's um, that's next, if, if, the, if the series goes on. But, because we're now basi- we've now basically catched up to Planet of the Apes. That's the thing, is that I feel like at the end it, of this one, I, thought of the that apes. I got the impression that that's humans gone, or at least in America or whatever... That was my impression because it was just that they said every they said everyone's coming to attack us, and then they're all just. I don't. They're not gone, but the 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 rest are all going to be like Nova. Yeah. Because I don't know. Have you seen Planet of the Apes? No. Nineteen sixty eight. Well, Nova's a character. Oh, right. Nova is in Planet of the Apes. She's like the love interest. Oh, but that means a lot more to me now then. She's a, and, and so she's like, I don't know. Well, she's Charlton. She's a bit younger than Charlton Hester. I don't know how old she is. But she's speechless um, and in ape captivity. So it is implying that like we're only a couple of decades off from Planet of the Apes now. Because Nova is the the love interest character in that film. Right, okay. The, this fr- franchise has got some of the nicest, most sort of un, un, undistracting, prequely set up stuff. Like, it's mm. the kind of stuff where people like you have seen the original films don't notice and don't feel like, what, that was weird. But people like me go, ah, like that Nova thing. And like the fact, because uh, in... Um, 1968 Planet of the Apes the humans can't talk right. and there was always there was always from Rise of the Planet of the Apes for me always this like why can't they talk why, why has this happened and for you as someone who doesn't or well, I don't know if you knew that but no. I don't know how much you know about the other but for someone who doesn't know like it just makes sense as a plot point for this film yeah. that humans are going out they're regressing that this this um, flu that was designed to combat Alzheimer's would have a, 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 you know effects on the yeah, brain yeah, yeah. that makes sense. It's, it makes sense, but for people like me, it's also a nice tying up the yeah tying up loose end. Uh, they mentioned in one of the other part of the ape sequels the the first ever ape who spoke said no, and that was like a oh, nice really? you know it's just a an, like a, a like a small line a little detail yeah. in that film, but works really well. But like something that becomes a pivotal plot point, they do. They are really good at the maintaining the continuity and thinking these things through so that they make logical sense into the new films uh, and into the older films. And I do think that that is one of the strengths that they do that really, really well. But do it in a way that to people who don't haven't seen the films, it's not annoying or confusing. Well, that's the thing is that I, I I only know two or three things from the original one. Yeah. One is the very obvious reference in Rise that everyone knows. The you, or, are you talking you about hands off me, damn daddy ape? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, go which on. Which I did know, yeah. and that's the only strong reference that I've gotten through the entire trilogy. Re- well, in the first film, there's a news broadcast with a spaceship yeah, going I did out. Get that one. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. I forgot about okay. that. The ape crucifixes are um, they're in Planet of the Apes as well, really? but they're humans on there. So it's like they've 
you know, I guess the apes learnt it and subverted it because they're in part of the apes, oh. the crew, but it's humans. Okay, on see, I wouldn't have um, got that, but the main thing was that I just remember, like, the posters for this one having them on the beach on horses, which is reminiscent of yes, the poster which from is, the first one, which is why I know. Yes, but there are nice little plot points, though, that do, um, like, like the Nova thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's, it's a good, it's, it's good as a prequel in that sense, um, they do that well, and that that continues through into this. Film. I think the thing is, is that Absolutely. because there's such a time difference between this prequel and what's to come, they have quite a lot mm. of free reign to just do whatever they want. On one hand, yes, but on the other hand, the sub the Planet of the Apes sequels, which are definitely canon because they've got they've taken details from them, they've got reference like small references to them and things, so that they are definitely acknowledging the sequels. They get quite time jumpy and yeah and backstory and so like there are definitely there's room for plot holes and they have avoided them. I don't know if I'd ever go through all of the old Planet of the Apes films. Oh no! Don't no 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 no! no. Watch the first one. Stop! <laughs> <laughs> like by all means, stop. But watch the first one. You should watch. The, I watched the first one last week actually for the first time in quite a while, and it is really really good. It's obviously it's a very different film, um, but it is nonetheless. It feels like it feels like they are part of the same franchise, even though they're stylistically very different, narratively very different. It just it's still smart and about something. It sort of reminds me a bit of like how I imagine it to be like how people talk about Star Trek at the beginning. Like it's more about yeah. the social issues like of sci-fi rather. Yeah. Than... Oh my god, the the sequels in particular, I would say, become. Quite White, overt with some of right. that stuff. Uh, these are much. These are much more subtle with it, I think, than the the older films. Like you know, the second one there was like so, Dawn of the Apes. There was some stuff about gun control, and the NRA got really mad because because I get well because the whole thing with Dawn of the Apes is it's all going well until Cobra gets the guns. Yeah, true. And it's like the guns. The guns sort of cause the the fuck up more than anything. And they do, like, there's lots of stuff where he's like, no guns, and, like, the guns are made to be very scary and loud, and I can see why someone would think it was anti-gun, but I also don't understand what the fucking problem is. It's almost like it, they're weapons of death. Yeah. It's almost like guns are, guns are bad things. Yeah, exactly. It's almost like, it's it's almost like someone's being reasonable. Like, this isn't, like, like, we, I normally don't care about all these social issues and people getting outraged and things but like gun control is just it's just fucking logical <laughs> I don't understand it like the, oh I need to defend my home so I need a fucking assault rifle like fuck off what a load of shit but it's quite ironic because Charlton Heston is like you know one of the spokespeople oh, yeah. for the NRA oh, <laughs> and so it's quite and um and, and in the first film it is very it feels very much like the opposite because like he the humans are like put down upon and, and brutalized and mistreated until Charlton Heston gets a gun <laughs> and then he puts all those apes in their place and like and he's like riding around shirtless on a horse holding his big masculine gun looking really <laughs> tough and like all of a sudden he's giving orders and so the gun gives him power. Right. But um like yeah, the 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 that film has the sort of gun control y stuff if you want to be there. The first film has its uh, animal rights stuff that um, is quite clearly a big point. And this one feels like less specific and more broad, but it's just about like empathy yeah, and definitely. things like that. That's that's like the theme, I would say. And it does it well. Yeah, I think I think as well is that I'm not saying they all had to have a social point at the at the bottom of mm. them, like the gun thing with Dawn. But it was it, it was the fact that, like you said, it's just very broad rather than mm. anything else that you can attach to it because it is so Although, detached from re regular life, really. Or is it, Jack? Because oh, what no. is the villain trying oh, to do? I completely <laughs> forgot about that stupid, stupid point. What is the villain trying to do, He's Jack? He's trying to build a wall, yeah. Mmm. I just Which is that, people yeah. have got so uh, it's an anti-Trump film. A fucking good. Like I can't. I didn't know there were people that would get upset about <laughs> this. Like I felt like the only people who still sort of supported Trump couldn't watch films. <laughs> like they were living in backward countries. I didn't know they had access to the internet to complain. 
I thought it was just generally regarded that by this point that he was a crook lunatic. So I didn't know that people would get that upset about anti-Trump. But apparently some assholes do. Secondly, so fucking what? Like, can't films have, have a point? Thirdly, I thought that we weren't supposed... Like, people who like Trump, I thought they were all like, oh, everyone gets offended by everything yeah, now. But the then thing. they get offended when a film mentions a fucking wall. Like, like you can't have it both ways. Like, oh, we can't say anything now. Everything's racist and sexist. Oh, the world is so politically correct. Did you just make an anti-Trump <laughs> film? How dare you? And then fourthly, it's like they think that this film was made over the last year and not over... Quite a lengthy period of time. It has to go through writing. It has to go through well, shooting. The it has to go through post production. Yeah, it it wasn't made over the course of the yeah. last few months. You dumb fucks. <laughs> the main uh, the main way that I saw people being mad, like there were a few that were annoyed that it was anti Trump, but there were the the few were just annoyed at how quote unquote obvious anti Trump it was. I thought no, there's not like it's not at any point is it. Obvious. No, it's not. Well, it's not obvious because it's not there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like that's the thing. We're legitimizing yeah, it by exactly. even saying, "Oh, they're getting mad that it's anti-Trump." Like, no, they're getting mad because they're idiots. That's that's why. It's, there's no no. It's the, the dumbest dumbest point. It literally, it is just the thing that they see. They hear the word wall. And they sort yeah, of yeah. The Game of Thrones is all about fucking White Walkers. Are they Mexicans? <laughs> Jon Snow should be talking about kafofi before long. Fucking dumb shit. Well, the thing is that they've already got all the stuff about the free folk being let into the country. <laughs> yeah. so they've already got the refugee yeah. crisis down as well. <laughs> uh. but, but yeah, it's like, on one hand, oh, blockbusters are all stupid and about nothing, yeah. and one tries to be about something, and... Oh! It's not even... Having... The wall isn't even a vital aspect of it. It's just... It fails! <laughs> It's, it's like, it's that's such a nothing point. That's how it's anti-Trump, Harrison. Uh, if it was pro the work is... would be brilliant and solve everything. <laughs> yeah, is that what they want? Do they want a pro-Trump film? Because wouldn't that just be propaganda then? Exactly. Like, what, what do they want? Well, they, want they want fucking triumph of the will. <laughs> what, what are they... I think I've lost where we were. Uh, we were we were on the fact that this film has, has a message and a right. point and then I think yeah. I got mad um, <laughs> so what other plot points did you have an, an issue with because it sounds like you had a couple the only one that really stands out to me after watching it because the thing is is that a lot mm. of the stuff in the camp just kind of blurs into one the the Woody Harrelson yeah, camp yeah the bit right. that stands out to me is that I'm, I'm actually completely fine like happy with the plot up until the camp is introduced. I definitely felt like the first third of the film was by far yeah, was the definitely. strongest. That was when I was enjoying it yeah, the most. Yeah. And I can't tell if that's because it was when it was fastest paced or if it was because when the story was best. I think it was because the sto- it was when the story was best and also it felt like it was leading towards something. And I think the conclusion ultimately yeah. just didn't give that, like you said. It, it just, it like all, all of my favourite moments from the film are in that first yes. third, like the, the opening action sequence. That bit that I thought was fucking brilliant in the cave. The music there, that was one of the moments where I was like, this music is really good. You know, when they're coming through the cave and yeah, it's yeah. like quite creepy, ominous, tension-building music. You've got the introduction of Bad Ape, which was one of the better character scenes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, like a lot of a lot of my favourite moments did come from that first third. I definitely agree with you there. I did think that the, the worst part of, that th- of the first half was... That uh, the gorilla with the flower and Nova, which is very, which Go was on. very, it, it it bothered me in the film like right off the bat because it was not not hit her, um, him giving her the flower. That was fine, whatever. But it's the fact that it's literally two minutes after is when he dies, and then it goes straight back, and it doesn't feel earned. And I get, I think mm. my logical reasoning for it is that there is also the gorilla in the camp. And so they thought if there is a if there's two gorillas and they look exactly alike, people are going to get confused. So we'll kill off the gorilla before they go in the camp. Oh, that's actually a character we didn't talk about, um, <laughs> and one of the more interesting Dude. ones. Uh, yeah. The the gorilla in the camp. He was one of the more interesting characters, one of the deeper characters. He's he's like Samuel Jackson from Django and Chain. Yes, like yeah. a, a like a, a racist against himself, and he thinks that 
that the, 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 all the other gorillas and apes are the same, except him. He, he's That's the thing, is that but it would have made more sense to be if he was treated more equal as well, because it is the fact that he is like beaten and called stupid, and at the same time he believes that he's going to be A-OK when everything ends. Mm. And so it, it was, if, if they were nicer to him and he felt more equal, then I could understand him more. And I think I'd be more invested in it. But I liked that he was he was more than he was more compelling than the human with the crossbow. He was the second most compelling yes. character under Woody Harrelson yes. in the camp. I agree. I did really enjoy as much as we we did say that the the camp stuff felt like where it started to get less interesting. I did love the escape sequences. We've had three of them now. We've had three prison breaks in these films, but they are always fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It did. It felt. It was. It was a moment where the film definitely felt fun rather than dark and brooding. And again, music. The music was really yeah. strong there. It felt like it had a, a more playful edge to it. I did really like the prison break from the poo throwing to the genuinely uplifting moment when they all got mm-hmm. out and and the music kind of swelled there. All of the prison breaky stuff with um, you know Maurice and Bad Ape underneath the tunnels, figuring out what to do. I liked all that stuff. That felt like when it was picking up yeah, again yeah, yeah. after the prolonged sequence of just like us having to have it explained how bad the ape situation mm-hmm. is. It was like, okay, great, got it. Now they can get yeah, on with yeah. it again. I think if I had to broadly generalize all of my points would be, I think the setup at the camp takes a bit too long. Like it just, it's a bit mm-hmm. too slow for their... And then the ending just fails to really hit the high that's been set up for. It's very, it's over very quickly. You mean the ending as in the ending of the conflict, though? Not the ending ending? Oh, yeah. I think the conflict of the humans and the apes is over very quickly, and it it feels very inconsequential. Mm. As in, I feel like it's, it's just that the apes get out of there, and then the humans just have everything, and the humans thing is very, over very quickly. And mm-hmm. it is just like an avalanche at the end of it. It's it's something that's kind of... It feels strange to say it's not... It's, I get what they were doing again. I get that it was definitely the point. Yeah, I think we've come around the, in the end. That, yeah. Yeah, but but like, it just it didn't feel as fulfilling yes, or satisfying yeah. as a film called War for the Planet of the Apes. It could have been. Maybe yeah, should yeah. have been. But the ending ending... It's very trilogy ending ending, I think. Doesn't mean it's not good. Yeah, no, it's a good scene. It was a good scene. I think, I think it would be more impactful... Had I felt like the ending was more rewarding before that, mm-hmm. it was coming after a disappointing like final conclude a battle. Yeah, really. it, you, you, I get what you, I get your kind of point. I think it lost some of its impact because of that, but I think on its own it works. And and I would say again, the whole film works very well for me. It's just these little story points that brought it down from dawn yeah, yeah. for me. It's all really story points. I don't mm-hmm. think that there's any. It, other aspect that felt like it went downhill. The the performances are all just as strong. Uh, Woody Harrelson makes the Colonel as compelling as I think he can. Yep. The music is phenomenal. I think it's still one of the best blockbuster scores in recent memory. I think the effects are amazing. I think that the small bursts of action when they happen, like that opening sequence yep. and like the bit in the caves, are great. And they do feel more satisfying because they are few and far between, but maybe just a little bit too much few and far between. But yeah, the 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 reason that we don't think this film is as good is just story mm. reason rather than anything to do with the technical execution or yes, the performances definitely. or or even the the script. Like I think the script is strong within the confines of the story it's telling. I get what you yeah, I get what you're saying yeah. with that. I know we've talked about all the technical points, but the thing that does... I, and I mentioned it earlier when I said about his style, but the cinematography for me was really... I really mm. liked this. Like, you guys talked about it earlier in the year that you thought that King of Kong Skull Island had some impressive cinematography for a blockbuster. This is oh, this, this much, much better. better. It's Very strong and also not that's showy. That's the thing, is that there's lots of striking images in it, but it's never in your yeah. face. Like, the first shot with it going by the helmets... And in another mm. film, come off as a very cheesy reference or a very on the nose reference to Vietnamese War. It because it goes past the multiple helmets as it goes up the mountain, and it really gives the mm. scale of the like one soldier, then two soldiers, then more and more and more. And I think that it is just little things like that that really show off how Matt Reeves really utilizes camera work 
like lighting as well, just to really sell every moment. Well, I was going to say lighting is definitely one of his strong yes, suits. Yeah. And you haven't seen Let Me In. One of my main reasons for liking Let Me In more than Let the Right One In is because some of the lighting and the and the, that kind of stuff in Let Me In is just breathtaking. Yeah. And, and I think that so far for me, he is four for four as a director. Like, I've liked all four of his films. I've, I, would, I would say I have full-on loved two of them, and I have really, really enjoyed the other two. So I think that the Batman is in the best hands it can be in. Whether or not the studio politics are going to get in the way is another thing, but I think if anyone's going to make that damn thing work, it's going to be yeah. him. Yeah, and well, the thing is, is that whenever now a director is like called for a film, I won't believe that they'll stick to a film until it's like in the can now. Because studios seem to be yeah. very much like they can change them out at any time. But I think that I think DC are slowly learning yeah. <laughs> that yeah. that's yeah. like not work, and they and they think they see him and go like, look, he's he's consistently done well. We need someone like yeah. that because we've been banking on Zack Snyder and David Ayer, and it didn't pan out how we hoped. The thing is, yeah, so, if it was the Batman film with the patience and the technical aspects of this film. I think I would really mm. enjoy that, especially yeah. if the, he had the budget to do... Well, I'm not saying that the problem with this was a budget, because it is just the story itself, but if he had the budget to do lots of action sequences as well. Matt Reeves directed Batman action sequences, but... He has talked about making it not an action film and making it a detective film. Yeah, I would definitely that's good. watch that. Yeah, that's, that's exciting. We haven't had that yeah. yet, and it's a, a big part of his character, so... Yeah. Very excited for that. Cool. I think that's just about everything then for... Yeah, I mean, we talked about it quite a lot, but I, I, I think that's because there's actually, refreshingly, for this podcast series, quite a lot to talk yes, about. Yeah, yeah, Unlike Pirates of the Caribbean, where it's like, like even the things we didn't like here, at least the the film was of a good enough quality to actually delve into those things, yeah, whereas yeah, with yeah, something yeah. like Pirates of the Caribbean, it's just like, this was a bit shit, <laughs> that was also a bit shit. Yeah. And like, but, but here, because it, it just feels like there is actually stuff here worth talking yeah, about. Exactly. Even the negative stuff um, is more interesting than the, the shit in, that we cover in other stuff. I'm going to see it again tonight, and, and I hope that with adjusted expectations in terms of the whole war That's thing, th- yeah. I hope that... I hope that I, I do come out full on loving it because I really did like it and there were moments where I full on loved it and I'm hoping that I'll like it more this time. The thing is, I don't know if I would end up liking it more or less next time because I think while I was more prepared for war, like an actual war, I think mm. the second time the slow pacing might seem even slower to me a second time round if I know everything's coming. Mm. I don't know, it, it could go either way, I think, with a second watch. Yeah, I, I kind of get that. I, I do. I see where you're going from. I think I'll just wrap up our section here then. Okay, so from now on, we'll cut to the interview that me and Harrison did with Cara Canoval, where we're talking to... uh, uh, She plays Maurice in uh, all three of the films. We talked about for for about 35 minutes as well, so it's quite hard to kind of summarise the whole interview. It's it's in-depth. We go on lots of things. We talk about orangutans themselves. We talk about performances. We talk about different bits and pieces from all the films and it's you know it's 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 our kind of taste in interview yeah. which means it's not just generic how was this what, what was the experience what, what like? should people expect yeah like it's it's our kind of more insightful yeah, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> uh interview. Well, it's, it's i think hopefully. that's just partly because she's she went really in depth with the interview and it was really great yes she talked to such she was, detail about she it. was great yeah yeah interview. and right and so we'll cut to that now and then wrap up everything this is so cool. We did it. What's your name? Uh, Harrison. Hi, Harrison. Nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you too. Thank you for doing this. Oh, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I know we planned to do this um, before uh, the, the release, but now that it's, it's come out, how, how do you feel the, um, the release has gone? Like the, the reaction to everything? People seem to be quite overwhelmed by it and um, by the huge journey of it. Um, and it is a huge journey, as you know, having seen it. And uh, the reaction seems to be like overwhelmingly positive. Um, I guess people are just, they're, they're touched and moved by it on any number of levels. Yeah. And um, that's just really cool. Yeah, no, I, I loved the film. It was, it was brilliant. It's one of my favorite films that I've seen in quite a long time. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to ask was um, in these Planet of the Apes films, we have people playing chimps, we have gorillas. 
and then we have an orangutan. And I was wondering what what distinguishes an orangutan playing an orangutan from playing, say, a chimp as Andy Circus would have to do, or from playing a gorilla. This is a wonderful question. It's one I actually haven't been asked often enough. I think um, <laughs> orangutans, because there are distinct differences between mm. all three species. Now, uh, I am not entirely familiar with chimpanzees. I have observed and studied gorillas a little bit. But one of the major differences with orangutans, well, well there's several, actually. Um, we obviously, obviously, with all three of them, humans share more than 97% of our DNA. Uh, it's mm-hmm. infinitesimal percentages. We, as human beings, we share the most uh, DNA with chimpanzees. Um, but in terms of the evolution, um, what, what originally happened, and I think going back, oh, things are, has nothing to do with me. I'm sorry, I'm just looking at uh, the evolution. <laughs> You was separated, I believe, originally about 14 million years ago when orangutans went off one way, gorillas and chimps went another way, and then about 10, I believe it's about 10 million years ago, and I may be, you know, in or out by a million years ago, mm-hmm. but that's when the human humans separated off from chimpanzees. It's, or it's, actually, maybe it was like at 10, the um, gorillas and chimps split, and then about 7 million years ago, I believe the uh, thing is, is that humans went there. So orangutans... I mentioned that because orangutans have been um, this species uh, unto their own for, even though we are all primates and we all, you know, associate from the same place for the longest time. And they, as a species, um, I feel having gotten to know several orangutans and studied them for the last seven years, they are, they, they are intrinsically orangutan. I don't know what else to say. That's just in terms of the character thing. Um, they live on the island only on the island of uh, Borneo and Sumatra and in Indonesia. So that's not they're uh, unlike the African apes. They are only they are the only Indonesian ape. They're also the only arboreal ape. Uh, so they their bodies have uh, evolved uh, in tandem with that. Their hands and their feet both function can have uh, functions as hands. So an orangutan can as easily grab you know with a foot as that. Yeah, I know. I have a lot of yoga. It's they they can as easily grab with a hand as with a foot, um, and they have that yoga flexibility, which is as a human being is something you have to bring to it. They have this massive upper body strength. Their legs are half as uh, long as their arms. So an orangutan's arms are twice as long as their legs. So I would say in terms of the in terms of how they move. Both gorillas and chimpanzees do have an ability to have a flat-footed back foot, but like push off. I'm just saying, as an actor, it's one of the things. But for me, as an actor, as Maurice, because Maurice's feet um, also have to, you have to have that. Hmm, I wonder if I can stand on this chair. I can't really. Um, but this, but this, can I show a little bit? Of, it's sort of like I would have a slightly, like a slightly. I don't know. I really can't show it in that little bit there. It's a full-legged stance, and I would have to drop my body posture down. And I also spent a lot of the film walking slightly on the sides of my foot, so that there'd be. So I'm trying to get my my carrying foot, even though I'm in runners and stuff like that, um, but into a kind of a curved thing there. So I'm feeling like all of that and any of the push offs that I have are from there. Um, the other things orangutans do. So the, in terms of uh, the the quadrupedal gallop, say that you watch the chimps doing through a lot of mm. a lot of. That's not an orangutan thing at all. Um, it's it's everything is coming from the upper body strength and the pull through. Right. So, a crossover walk or a crutch walk. You often you'll often see me doing a crutch walk as Maurice if I'm coming down something, and it's usually a boom, 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 boom like a double a double landing thing, which I've taken from the mature males that I've observed for the past several years. Um, so there's differences in the walking like that, and then of course they have this huge the mature males especially. Um, have this huge upper body thing, and the with the mature males, the the cheek pads and the throat sac that creates this, inc- the, and that's something that develops when um, they become an adult, um, like a voice dropping thing, <laughs> and uh, only for the males. For anybody who doesn't know about orangutans, it's only for the males. And once they develop that, then they have the capacity to make long calls, which is the classic. Um, the classic vocalization for mature male orangutans. And that is a huge thing. And I've, I've been fortunate to be in the presence of and listen to and record for my own study and to bring into my own voice uh, the long calls of, I think, five different mature males. They've, they've um, gifted me with letting me hear them. And then, boom, I get out the, I get out 
from the court, and each of them is different. So for each, each depending on their age, uh, there is individual orangutans, obviously, there is individual as any of us as humans. So uh, the mature males who I've heard long call, the mature males that I've gotten to know, they are each, each as individual as Maurice is. So my long calls as Maurice, and there's a, a long call can be, it can be a massive thing that is, is quite lengthy, starts out small with a and goes off into this huge thing that then eventually, depending on what they're trying to say, can settle into some <coughs> some size at the end of it. Yeah. But depending on, or it can be an abbreviated long call, it's sort of a description for the sound that only is produced by mature male orangutans. Totally different from the chimps, obviously. Totally different from the gorillas and the silverback gorillas who uh, have very specific things that they do as well. Um, the, uh, and yet even with the orangutans that I've known and the female orangutans I've known, um, they, each, they each can have very unique, specific sounds that they make. I know one orangutan, Malati, who I, I'm, seven years later, I'm still trying to, to get this in my voice and I haven't been successful yet. Uh, entirely successful, um, but I have brought it to a part of Maurice, not so much, well, actually a couple of times in war, but a couple of times in dawn as well. Melody has this thing that's like a bark, but it sounds like a... It, it's, I'd have to get in, but it's, when you hear it, it goes into a growly thing too, and she's a female, and you go, but the first time I heard it, I thought, it's a bear, it's a bear, what's going on? <laughs> Female. And it's one of the only sounds she makes. There's another um, male, Haran, who is Tawan's son, who um, his nickname is Squeaker because he sometimes squeaks very high pitched when he's frightened about something. That's unique to oh. Haran, the Squeaker. So each of them, and then Chinta, another orangutan I know, I personally have not heard her make any sounds, though I know, I know she does. But as I say, they're each very individual like that. But their sounds are complete, their vocalizations are completely different. From gorillas and chimpanzees, there's none of this. Ooh, 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 none of that. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so when it comes to the sounds of Maurice, would you say that it's more like a, an amalgamation from uh, all the different uh, orangutans that you've studied, or is it more like you've uh, deliberately uh, tried to make new sounds for Maurice to create his own uh, identity? Um, both in a way, because there's two things I'm doing as an actor with. Well, a couple of things I'm doing as an actor with this. Um, one is maintaining and striving to maintain and create Maurice's orangutan integrity throughout. So that means in terms of the quality, the vocalization, the movement, the everything. However, within this storytelling, um, there's a the specific story of Maurice. His background, his uh, character background is a performing circus orangutan, which he was before the San Bruno so-called sanctuary um, in Rise. And the fact that he was performing and had sign language as a skill, um, so there's so there's a certain sophistication, and um, a uh, he's been um, what's the word uh, when you're used to being around human beings. Maurice had that, not in a good way. So he's been very much in, imprinted, you know, in a, in a certain way, and uh, so that's also part of him, which is so that it, very individual to him, but also. And not that I never discussed this with uh, anybody, not, not, not with Matt Reeves, not with Rupert Wyatt, not with anybody. But I did look early on as an actor going, all right, where is Maurice's place within the larger storytelling of Planet of the Apes? And as an actor, I felt it was my responsibility to make a choice early on and go, who do I think Maurice ultimately is within this? Summer early on, this was just me, like, but oh, before for Summer Between Rise and Dawn, I went, Maurice is, is I think, ultimately, and I can't, this is just for me, I just went, Maurice is the lawgiver. So, that's, I just felt like that is probably, so I, I made that choice quietly for myself, actually this is the first interview I've ever said it in, that I actually felt that all wrong. So with that comes, to my mind as an actor, a certain responsibility to um, make that part of his character as well, in terms of his vocalization, like everything he does going forward. So there's something about the fact that the lawgiver would um, be, is quite fundamentalist in a way, very like we keep the ape rules, we set up the ape rules. And I felt that had to be part of Maurice's character. And so that affected in a way 
what I think what what when Maurice chooses to speak and when he doesn't speak as well. There's something about them, and the, so the movements towards that, and so through war in particular, I did bring more sound into my performance than orangutans that I know would make. Like you'll often hear me throughout the film. Going, <laughs> Or whatever, whatever it is. Like mm. so, there's more vocalization for Maurice throughout this film than there has been previously in some ways. Um, but that, for me, is moving towards within that character trajectory of going and then finally speaking, as I do for very good reason at the end of this particular yeah. film. So yeah, so there, I think it's it's like that. It's, it's the storytelling of Maurice here. It's orangutan integrity, and then it's also Maurice's place in terms of whatever I've um, assessed it to be within the larger storytelling and the mythology of Planet of the Apes. Um, you kind of touched up on this a little bit earlier, but I was just um, wanting to ask, obviously there's quite a big difference between male orangutans and female orangutans, both in terms of their behaviour and in terms of their physicality. And I was wondering if, when you're playing Maurice, do you ever think about him as a male character, or is that something that you kind of, don't even consider when you're playing him. Um, originally, when I was first cast as Maurice, and you know, Rupert Wyatt cast me as Maurice, and I, I remember when he actually said, I first met him, and uh, when he first, he actually said to me, outright, he said, I want you to play Maurice. He's old, he's fat, and he's from the surface. And the only thing that I could think was, he? <laughs> and, I mean, because I was just starting to get to know about orangutans, my study of them was in its true infancy. And so I hadn't even paid attention to any of the male orangutans. At the time, I'd, I was looking at the pictures of the females and the pretty little oh, babies, and, I'm so much, like whatever that is, and then thinking, those guys, like with the great, <laughs> like, whoa, what's that? Once I dove in and just went like, okay, this is not part of, um, my life or this is part of my journey as an actor is to become this character then no I, I, I stopped thinking about you know gender issues yeah there's other really things that go into that there, I mean, there's the sound there's his weight which I've had to bring to him it is not something that so it's more specific things like that like with his weight through the first film because it's not the uh, Weta can't make that up later as brilliant as their work is they can't make up the you know landing of Maurice yeah that's up me. So what we did through Rise, bless Terry Notary's heart and his wonderful training and quadrupedal walking, but he attached weights to each of my arm stilts. So as I was trucking along, you know, uh, trying to keep up with the chips, um, I had these extra weights on my arms and that really helped me. Partway through the filming of Dawn, I started Dawn also with the weights on my arms to still, you know, keep me in that weight. And partway through Dawn, I don't know rem remember when, maybe when we got to New Orleans or something, um, I went... I think I can lose them. And so that became an uh, innate part of me. So by the time we got to war, besides the fact that I could just sort of land in Maurice and the quadrupedal walking and running, which is incredibly cardiovascular, uh, if you just got down, if you tried it for maybe five minutes, you'd go, no, really? No, really? <laughs> more than this? It's an amazing thing to, to do. But by war, while well, I still had, and I had to train hugely to prepare for this, but now Maurice's weight is in my body, and if I just get the arm still, boom, I'm there. So it's yeah, I don't I don't think of it as being a different gender thing. I just enter into Maurice as I would into any other character I'm playing. And um, you you mentioned in your your previous answer that you consider Maurice to be kind of like uh, the lawmaker, and I was just wondering where you'd consider his sort of paternal side in that in his character. Because we sort of saw it with uh, Alexander in uh, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, and much more now with uh, Nova in War. And yeah, I, I was just wondering where that sort of fits into Maurice as a character. Not so sure. I haven't thought about it as paternal. I have thought about it as um, um, there's something like where Maurice started in Rise is so like in that when we were in that little caged environment and stuff that's not not a good one. Um, and Maurice connected with Caesar through the sign language. I think it's probably, mm. for Maurice, and this is just my assessment of it, was possibly his first time connecting with another ape able to communicate because they had sign language. 
So that was so profound, and his connection to Caesar was so profound, that for Maurice, who came from a place of, like, guarded watching everything, you know, that he's just good. And he probably did what he was supposed to do to survive as a circus performer. But once he reached there, then he just watched and would do nothing unless it was, you know, he knew it would be safe, which is also quite an orangutan quality to be very specific about actions, only to take, only to take effective actions and not do anything gratuitous. But I think it was more than entering into a paternal quality of thing. His connection with Caesar kind of opened him up a bit so that he became more, um, sort of came more into himself, more willing to be the yeah. and, and the character that he actually is. So then when we get to Dawn and Maurice meets Alexander, it's less about paternalism, I think, than um, he made a connection with, he, like he was interested in the book and then Alexander gave him the book. And that's like, uh, 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 you know, it, 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 it just speaks to Maurice on a level yeah. that, like that. So he, he was responsive to that when later in Dawn, he said to um, Alexander and his family, run. you know, it, it, like the, the one time he had to speak in that was to go, was to offer something. So then coming to, no, coming to meet Nova and finding Nova in this one, and actually on the first day we had, it was about, it was, there was an early day before we started filming where Matt Reeves and Andy Serkis and I and Terry Notary and Michael Adam played, actually. We were in a room going through the script because as a posse, we wanted to track through the journey. So I had a couple of questions for Matt Reeves. Not a lot because the script is so well written. And so everything that's on the page is everything you need as an actor. But I did have a couple of questions for Matt. And one of the things I asked him was, um, when Maurice gets to Nova, what's your feeling on why he takes her? I just thought as an actor, I was that. And, and I'll never forget Matt Reeves went, she's a broken bird. You take her along with a broken bird. And I went, great, thank you. That's it. <laughs> there was no extra, oh, you know, as beautiful as all that, it, or, you know, as, as specific and all that is, that's the place that Maurice is functioning from. It's a very organic, very, I almost like if I was to put it in words, I don't know why I must do this, but I must do this. Mm. And so the journey begins rather than, the journey, rather than going, I take care of you and answer. It's like it, it initiates a question of a journey rather than finishing one. So not paternal, maternal, it's just, so then Maurice is on that journey. He's following an inner uh, impulse that he simply must. You just touched upon something that I thought was really interesting. because I think Matt Reeves is very, very good at character work and particularly, I think, is evident in both of these Planet of the Apes films that he's made doing character work with minimal dialogue. And I was wondering, as as an actor working with Matt Reeves, what do you think it is about his... What is it that he does that manages to make all of those silent, calm scenes work? How does he make those non-dialogue, non-talky, non-action scenes so engaging and so deep? It's a commitment to truth that, that I don't know how else to put it. He's going for the truth of the emotion, the truth of the story, and working with him is um, it's incredible. I mean, it's, you, the experience couldn't get any, any better because he is looking at every moment. He's just going, okay, and then what about this? But it's, it's already, he's already, he and Mark Bombeck have already started by giving this to us on the page. And then obviously, well, obviously working in tandem with someone like Andy Circus, please, you know, <laughs> you know. It's like, um, uh, you just go, okay, what, I, what do I have to do? Show up, be available, um, know where I'm going, just be entirely present and give 5,000%. Like, just be there entirely. So it's a matter of just the focus and then honing in. And I believe that's what Matt Reeves does because we may do something, um, we may do, I don't know, sometimes 5, 10, 20 takes into something, but it, it's not necessarily, oh, do it differently, oh, do it differently. It's not, he's not... Um, what's the word? He's not sort of playing around with us as actors. He's he's like he's honing in with a chisel or he's carving like where you're going. Through, right? Ah, there it is. Now I've got it right there. And so as actors, you just go on that with him and then you just go, 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 go. So the, the his attention and his listening to the inside story, um, it, it, his, his attention is so deep and is so in there 
that what he's crafting is on a very deep level, and I think that's why it holds interest. And then, obviously, when he's editing and in the, in the, in refining and which beats he's actually going to share uh, that's, that remain in the film, um, uh, uh, the, the same attention is there. Now, that said, basically, I can't think of... I was going through and going, is there anything that I filmed that didn't show up on the screen? And I don't think so. So it's like everything we did... Like everything that we did... Uh, I like the whole thing was there. So basically I've already experienced the film I yeah. just to speak for my own part as an actor is the refinement of that was there on the sound stage or out on location or wherever we are, we were or in reshoots or whatever. So it's, it's his attention to emotional truth detail is so, oof, um, he, yeah. his laser shot. he's a truth seeking missile. That's what he is. <laughs> Uh, one aspect of the the character that I wanted to talk about was um, that uh, over the past three films, Maurice has basically become uh, like a fan favourite. And I, I was just wondering uh, what you think has caused him, uh, what particular characteristics has caused him to become, uh, you know, resonate with audiences so much? I, I think we'd have to ask, like, people who get attached from the outside, because I don't think I can answer that one. I, I really, because what I can say is from my own experience of getting to know orangutans and specifically to one who Maurice is based on from my perspective. Um, and then Maurice very much is inspired by to a mature male orangutan who um, I first observed in 2010 and then got to know throughout the rest of his life. Um, and to one whose name translates as master and truly was the master in every way. So all I can say is that the experience that I had getting to know to one and the gifts that he gave me along the way in terms of guidance on just about it. I mean, you know, like, uh, like inter- I could observe him and I learned a great deal that I brought into Maurice. But all that aside, just in terms of my own relationship or communication with him as Karen to Tawan, um, I had this feeling of this, like, I felt like I was in the presence of a master and of so a, a being who is considerably greater than myself in some way um, and very compelling and irresistibly compelling in such a way that once I got to know Tawan, who then introduced me to, I have always felt like this, Tawan introduced me to the rest of his orangutan family and then all the people working in conservation and then the larger world of orangutans around the world like that. Um, it's something that I think it felt, sort of feels like magic. It's a, part of my life that will, will only grow now. It's been growing, and I, I can't ever see it stopping. So I, is it something along those lines that once people actually get the experience of hopefully some sense of orangutan that you go, I, I need to know more? I don't know. I don't know. But I, but I, am, um, I hope that I am continuing to play him with orang, orang, orangutan integrity, Maurice. And, and hopefully this does evoke some sense of the incredible being that Tuan was in his lifetime. Uh, I was wondering if there was anything, um, going back to sort of the, the physical differences between humans and orangutans, I was wondering if there was anything, perhaps it could even be something that seems fairly inconsequential, that was quite difficult to do just because you're trying to do it like an orangutan, like, I don't know, horse riding or something. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about, how about every step of the physical process for this? Um, as I said, quadrupedal walking alone. But I'm just saying, I, I've been a dancer for most of my life and done 20 years of musical theater and had some pretty big dancing roles and everything. So when it came to like, and I mean this seriously, when it came to quadrupedal walking and I looked at it and went, well, what's so difficult about left foot, right hand, right foot, <laughs> left foot, right hand? Please, I can do triple pirouettes. Give me a break. Then you, then you get over there and you do that and you go, and the next thing you know, you're in a tangle on the floor. It, and if you've actually got some orange stilts at some point or some toilet plungers, you could try and just go left foot, right hand, right foot, left hand. Get your weight onto your front arms. You will find that, you, and then try to move and then start to use those things. So this was difficult from the get-go. On the first one, especially with the weights on my arms, my shoulder joints were just screaming. Um, it, the, the training that is required to be able to do this with some facility and ongoing cardiovascular strength and everything that's huge um the upper body strength uh when we were doing rise and 
you know, there's the bit when they're swinging under the bridge and stuff at the end. Mm. Well, some like in a couple of those things, you'd, you'd they'd have the lo- a location shot, but then um, we would do later just for specific things like that that were sort of extraordinary. You're not going to hang an actor from underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. It's not going to happen. So they do that thing, and then and then when we were in the volume later, we'd still have to do everything. Like you know, escape from the sanctuary was literally jumping off a platform you know, six feet above something else, boom, and wang, 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 wang down. So it's like you do it all the same things. Jumping off of the cars was jumping off of, you know, same height things and everything. But um, I remember the swinging under the bridge thing. As much as I have built up strength, uh, there is no way I could conceivably come up with the strength to wing, 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 like under something like that. So they they um, created a sort of a ladder thing and mm. it, for me to swing like that. But even at that, Three swings later, I was like, oh, oh. So, so <laughs> at the time, he put, okay, let's get the apple boxes. So they put little apple boxes, and I wish I could show you, because I literally was like going up here. I was swinging, literally, but underneath, way down there, my toes were just touching the apple box, and I was like, the answer going, and you didn't see my feet. And then, obviously, what they get later is the swinging thing. Yeah. So that was like things like that. So that, that upper body strength to do those things. Other climbing things, like when we did all the scaling of the buildings at the end of dawn, and we did that on real like rebar things that were separated, you know, like this. And we climbed all of that. Um, that I found hard where with the chimps, because they have that back push off thing, um, they can use more of their back feet. But for me, it's more to have an integrity and have to use like basically this would just have to be there. Like the lower part of my anatomy would not be a push off place. So I had to pull myself up and down all that stuff just with my arms. That was extremely difficult. So physically, so, yeah, those were, those were, um, yeah, those were the, the most extraordinary things where it took that kind of swimming thing. And then with the horseback riding, the horseback riding was amazing, especially in this film. Um, and I had, we, we did ride horses in, the, in Dawn, but not a great deal. But with this one, obviously, that required a facility not just to ride for me, but to um, guarantee the safety of Amaya riding behind me, which and she right. rode behind me throughout. Um, and, uh, and we were in incredibly challenging environments in the snow and on the beaches with waves coming in, you know, literally on, on the open ocean there. And, and I have a, had a beautiful horse, Navarone, through the film who a uh, very gentle, gentle soul, but also an 18 hands high Dutch Friesen stallion. So like when you see me dismounting off of him, this is, you know, these are considerable <laughs> long way. <laughs> so um, I found that challenging, like all that physical stuff, the dismounts and the mounting and stuff. But I did have a wonderful month long training with um, Danny Virtue here in Vancouver, who's a horse whisperer for sure. And Danny trained us more than anything to manage our own energy so that at all times I could, it was my responsibility to make sure that Navarone felt okay with me, with wearing this huge blue couch on my back. and So Navarone had to get used to me being like that. And, and also, so I had to be able to walk around in front of him and with the arm stilts. And it, it was, it was quite the journey, but it was, one of the most beautiful gifts of this film was that month. And I'll never forget a day, probably been three weeks into the horse training when, uh, and doing lots of different things in different terrains. And Danny would take me up onto the hills and around every day. Cause I was probably the least experienced on horseback of anybody. Terry and Andy had a lot more experience than I did. that right. So Danny would take me out on trail rides and I'd have to learn to teach never oh well, not teach never but never loved love to like eat leaves and bushes and stuff along the way bit of a pushover so we would be going on the next thing i know danny would be riding ahead of me and never would go <laughs> and i think oh, he think he'd be a whole bush and we're walking along <laughs> oh no danny doesn't turn around right now don't turn around and then danny would turn around and go aaron rein in your horse and i'd have to get him over to spit out the bush and carry on and so but it was training me to to be with all of this stuff Sorry, just quickly check it. Are you still okay for time? Yeah, yeah. Oh, great, great. Thank you. Um, is it okay then just to jump into like what, one last question then? Um, okay, we, we have five more minutes, yeah. As this is kind of like the, the end of the trilogy, I was just wondering uh, how you're planning to uh, continue your, your work with orangutans and the, the kind of the connection that you've built with orangutans over the past uh, few years. 
First of all, I will say it's not. Some people sometimes say, what about your work with orangutans? And it's so not work. I study them and I'm a student of them. I'm a really grateful student. And I feel I feel that strongly, like the choice of words there, because I happen to know many fine people who work with orangutans in, in, and I'm following their work in Borneo and Sumatra, supporting as I can, and also at the Center for Great Apes in Wachula, Florida. So I have, like I foster orangutans in a couple of different places, the Center for Great Apes, um, the Sumatran Orangutan Conservation Program in Sumatra, and then the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation in Borneo. There are many other organizations doing incredible work uh, in the conservation of orangutans that I do follow, but these are the these are the groups that I've gotten to know over the last six years and follow their work most closely. Um, so, and also the orangutan SSP in North America, the species survival plan, through whom at their conferences, I've been introduced to everybody doing this incredible work out there. So will I study and learn from orangutans for the rest of my life now and do what I can to follow and support? Yes. Um, where I, I can't see that stopping. And also the orangutan family that I know in Seattle and um, the relationships I've made with the caregivers there uh, that has connected me to the water conservation community. Yeah, that's ongoing. There's two people in particular in Seattle at Woodland Park Zoo, um, Laura McComeskey and Andy Antilla, who are, they were, they introduced me to Tawan. Not the first time I went to meet, to, to observe Tawan, I observed him on my own. But when I was brought, invited back for an introduction, these two wonderful people introduced me further to the world of conservation, the orangutan SSP, which led to the Center for Great Apes, and Dr. Singleton's work in Sumatra, Dr. Graham L. Baines's work with DNA. Um, it, there's an amazing group of people working out there that I follow. So, yeah, will it continue? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Great. Well, yeah, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us, especially for, for so long. Yeah, no, thank you. It was really interesting. Thanks, you guys, so much. Okay, you can hang up because I don't know how to. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Cool. Okay. Yep, yeah, so that was <laughs> so that was the interview. Um, hopefully, yeah, if, if you want to just, just see the interview, that should be up separately on the channel, as well as this whole podcast, which will go up uh, on our YouTube channel, Real Opinions. Recently, just for like podcast updates, we're now on a, a new server thing, so it's all the backlog is now available. It used to be just the, the most recent six episodes, I believe, but now the entire backlog will be available for everything, and each uh, episode now has individual artwork, and if you go on the Podient, it's realopinions.podient.co, uh, all past episodes as well have bookmarks that Harrison's done, copied over from the YouTube video. So you should be able to skip through the videos to get to certain points. As well as uh, backstory scripts, which we did do on this feed, is now going to be on its completely separate feed. Uh, if you just go on any any podcast app or service, just type in uh, backstory scripts, and it'll be a completely different one with, uh, again, it's got its own separate art now. And I'll, if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, it'll be in the description uh, to find all of that. And on the subject Ooh. of backstory scripts, um, we haven't done one for quite a while, but there is actually one on the That's way. That's the thing. The reason yeah. that it's the reason it has not been published yet is a uh, uh, how would we phrase it? Just a, a wanting to avoid legal trouble. Reasoning. Yeah, that's the thing. Well, we we um, talked about it briefly in one of the previous real opinions podcasts, so it's quite mm -hmm. uh, obvious to to know roughly what I, I don't. I feel like we can just say what it is, but it, we no, we can say what it is. We we are covering um, the. Carrie Fukunaga's, I hope I've said that yeah, yeah, close yeah. to right, version of It, which leaked uh, sometime in, I don't know, was it March? We're covering that, but because we don't know how much the film will change exactly. or stay the yeah. same in the, the new one that's coming out in September, we don't want to put it up in case it ends up being really close to exactly, that film yeah, and we end up inadvertently spoiling so we're waiting until the release of the film before we put that up. But it is actually produced and on yeah, the Yeah, so it's, it's completely ready. It's just waiting to look, like click to go live. But or if you hear this before it comes out, I'd recommend definitely, because it's I think it's my favourite so far. It's the longest by far, definitely. Mm. But it's also, I think it's the funniest. And I also think it's the best script that we covered so far as well. Yeah, well, that was it. I think it was just much like this. It was more entertaining to talk about because exactly, it was yeah. of a higher quality. So, that, so that'll be coming out at some point in the future, along with... Hopefully, other episodes, maybe even before that, depending on how long. I don't know when yeah. it comes out yeah. exactly, but hopefully, um, that's a completely separate feed. It will still be on our YouTube channel, so you can still catch them on there. 
uh, if you're just subscribed through here, but um, it's on, let me think, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, Pocket Casts. I've added like loads now, so it's, it is on all of those and you can find them anywhere. Great. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye. I'm doing it normal this time. Keep them on their toes. <laughs> Keep them on their toes. It's just a normal Changing sign expectations. Off.